Let's go ahead and uh, we're going to get started. My plan for tonight is that we not go past uh, 7.40. I'd like to get everybody out of here by, by 7.40. We'll see if we can do that. But uh, we're going to start with a word of prayer. And I do, I do just want to say again, this is more than formality. Uh, prayer is a key to good Bible study. So, Lord Jesus, help us tonight as we open your word. Um, you, you did these things, and we're reading about what you did. And then you inspired the authors, and today you work in us, even as we read your word, to illuminate and to show us what it is that you want us to learn from it. So help us, Lord, today. We ask this in your name. Amen. So welcome, Andrea. Um, it's yeah. good to see you. Everybody else is, is uh, repeat coming back. I did have one other new person who may or may not join us in a little bit here. But I am going to share my screen. And um, <clears throat> that's going to take all of the pictures over to one side or to the top or to the bottom. But you'll still be able to see uh, people on camera. But what we're going to do is, um, huh, you just didn't let me do it. I did it last week. <laughs> Open system preferences, okay. There we go. Oh, that's why. Okay, let's see if that does it now. There we go. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we're going to come here to Bible Gateway again, and tonight... We're going to study Mark 2, 1 to 12. All I'm doing here is just bringing up some text so that we can copy and paste. And then we're going to go to this program, which is just an editor, uh, a document editor, so that we can begin to work with the, uh, the text. So let's read through the text together. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the, mat, the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. When some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what's he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, and so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier <clears throat> to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. So, do you remember one of the first things that we do is we begin to look for repetitions, 
comparisons or contrasts, causes and effects. And one of the ways that we do that is by looking for what we call indicating words that indicate the presence of one or more of these relationships. What do you see as you look here? Hi, Shirley, welcome. Hi, <laughs> thank you. Uh, glad you can join us. Uh, I am sharing my screen, so things on your computer guess, might look a little bit different. Yes, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've just asked the question, what, are, what do we observe here in this passage? What do we see? We got a doo wop singer somewhere in the background, don't we? <laughs> it does sound like it. Let me let me just indicate a couple of things here. This word so may indeed be an indicating word. Um and frankly, that's about it. We don't see repetitions. We don't have indicating words for comparison or contrast. We do have this word so that probably means that this up here is a condition or a protesis. And this down here is an apodosis or a result. What Jesus is saying here is because he knows that they're questioning his authority to forgive sins. So he'll prove that he has the authority to forgive sins by healing the man. That's the only really explicit relationship that we see. One of the reasons for that is because this is narrative material. If this were a teaching, we would see repetitions and causes and effects and comparisons and contrast. But it's not. It's narrating history. So in a case like that, we get a lot farther by asking who, what, when, where, how, and why. So let's just tackle those questions. Who, first of all, who's involved in this passage? Jesus. So we have Jesus. Who else? A paralyzed man and his friends. Who else? The people that came to see Jesus. The crowd. Who else? The scribes. Yeah, scribes or teachers of the law. Okay, that's good. Now, it'll be interesting to look at this passage from the point of view of each individual or each group. We're going to get into the what here in just a second uh, by looking at each one. What was it that Jesus did? Healed the paralyzed man. That's not all. He was preaching. Mm -hmm. Great. And one more thing. He forgave the, par the sins of the forgiven of the paralyzed man. Which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. 
What did the paralyzed man do? He went home. He, he actually did nothing <laughs> until he was healed. Then he, he uh, grabbed his mat mm -hmm. and went home. What did his friends do? Helped him get to Jesus. They carried their friend to Jesus. Yeah. And there's one more thing that they did. They believed. Yeah. Scripture says, uh, when Jesus saw their faith, he didn't even heal the paralyzed man because of the paralyzed man's faith. It was the faith of the four friends. What did the crowd do? Praise God. Praise God after the healing. Before the healing, they just uh, sort of... Uh, gummed up the path <laughs> nobody could get to jesus they were just all in the way and what did the teachers of the law do criticize jesus absolutely they did they called him uh, a blasphemer And they just kind of were quiet after, after that. When did this take place? If you look at the passage a few days after leaving Galilee. Yeah. Yeah, they actually didn't leave Galilee. They were still in Galilee. Galilee's the region. Oh, okay. So they're still in Galilee. So a few days after is how it starts. A few days after what? He had hmm. healed others like Simon Peter's mother-in-law, the leper, and many others. The point is, it was a few days after Jesus' rise in popularity People were, when he was in a town, people were crowding around him, and making it difficult to get to him. So this kind of keeps with that. But it's also a few days after seeing these miracles. Where? In this, this town, and I cannot pronounce the name. Yeah. <laughs> Capernaum. That was the same town that Simon Peter lived in. And then how? Well, it was a miracle. So there's not a real answer to the how question. Mm -hmm. Now, we're coming down to one of the more important questions. Why? Um, I'll let you guys think about why and where you're going to apply it. Would the, is it possible that the why is um, he showed them that he could forgive their sins by the example of he was able to make the man walk yeah yeah who could yeah, not walk absolutely. and so if he could do one he could do the other that he was saying he could do yep yep i think you're on to something there why did the friends bring the man to jesus because he was sick and they believed that jesus could heal yeah mm-hmm 
Faith. Our faith was that strong. Yeah. What did Jesus do when they brought the man to him? Healed him. Forgave his sister. Forgave him. Think about that for a moment. These fellows go to a great deal of problem, great deal of trouble. They, uh, first of all, have to get their paralyzed friend, put him on a mat. They have to carry him. I imagine, uh, you know, he probably wasn't light. Uh, they got there, they found the crowd there. They said, well, tell you what, let's go up on the roof. We'll open a hole, lower him down to Jesus. And they did. And it's kind of obvious what they're wanting. And that's not what Jesus does. They brought the man to Jesus so Jesus would heal him. And Jesus looks at him and says, I forgive you. I can imagine the four men going, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> that's, that's not why we brought him. It's like going to a doctor's office and the doctor says, how's your car running? Want me to go take a look at it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I come to the doctor's office for a specific reason. I want you to heal me. I don't need you to look at my car. Um, but Jesus forgave him. Do you think the man needed forgiveness? Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We all do, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I've, I've uh, <clears throat> thought about this passage, and uh, you know what? Um, I've known people who are paralyzed and sometimes they're kind of bitter people uh, sometimes they blame God and the amazing thing is here is God looking in the eyes of this paralytic and he says I forgive you you know Somehow, I, I just wonder if uh, the paralytic said to his friends, uh, take me home, guys. I got everything I need. <laughs> I'm forgiven. Take me home. But then another thing happens. Um, why did the teachers of the law Criticize Jesus. Jesus taught them all a lesson to the lawmakers. He was teaching them a lesson, one that they weren't ready to, to pick up, one that they just weren't getting. Kind of made them mad. You can understand that. Um, they, they think he committed blasphemy by he saying he forgave them. That's right. That's right. I, uh, okay, do you, do you, uh, do you see Auschwitz on your uh, screens now? Yeah. Yes. So last Friday in Philip's class, he dealt with this very question. So uh, I got about a uh, three minute clip here. Let's just listen to that. Just listen uh, to what Philip says about that question. Why did the teachers of the law criticize Jesus? Can't hear. Can't hear very well. 
I can't hear it. I mean, I can't hear it. Can't hear anything. Uh, there's just silence right now. Oh. The Old Testament indicated that you had to take a sacrifice in, and yet at that particular point in time, I don't think they were in the sacrificial system, so they would have to go to the priest, and they would have to forgive their sins, uh, but they'd have to atone somehow. Yeah, yeah. So, so there was a sacrificial system in the temple. We read about these in, uh, about this in the early books of the Bible, um, reading about the sacrifices that God instituted, bringing, uh, for example, a lamb. Um, we have different sacrifices for purification, for atonement. We have the Day of Atonement, uh, once a year, talked about in Leviticus 16. So there were ways that individual sins could be forgiven through the sacrificial system in the temple even in Jesus' day. But is Jesus a priest? Here again, I'm not thinking about Hebrews and its reflections on Jesus after the event spiritually. But was Jesus from the tribe of Levi? Was he a trained priest? I think you know why I'm asking that question. No, he wasn't. <clears throat> uh, Jesus had no authority, if you like. You could go to the temple, you could do certain things, the priest could pronounce God's forgiveness but Jesus is here pronouncing God's forgiveness. Your sins are forgiven. That is, your sins are forgiven by God. But he doesn't have the authority within the system to do that himself. And yet, clearly, Jesus does that with authority. And he does actually uh, pronounce and enact, bring forgiveness of sins. So that's something, again, else which sets Jesus apart as having a unique authority, something that tells us how Jesus uh, saw himself, that he claimed this right to pronounce the forgiveness of sins. So uh, there we go. What they were rejecting was the authority that Jesus was claiming for himself, mm -hmm. the authority to forgive sin. And they said only God can do that. They were right. They were absolutely right. But they didn't make the next obvious step. So Jesus must be God. Mm -hmm. um, now, I want to kind of step back from the study that we're doing and just talk about the process. You'll notice here we are asking questions and then we are looking for answers. We're finding those answers primarily in scripture, but in this case we went beyond scripture. Uh, we uh, actually went to a, a third party, Philip, and uh, Philip helped us to uh, understand a little bit more about uh, what was actually taking place here, uh, why the teachers of the law criticized Jesus. So uh, back to the study now. So what else? Are there, are there other questions that you like about the passage? What else stands out to you in the passage, or what other questions would you have about the about the passage? I will prove that I am son of man. Yeah, yeah. What in the world does that mean, son of man? One of the things that we can do, um, we can go back to Bible Gateway. You can look up not only passages, but you can look up phrases. So if we look up Son of Man in Bible Gateway, you'll see here that it, it occurs twice in Numbers, twice in Joshua, and on and on. It occurs 92 times in Ezekiel. But we're going to look here at Daniel. Daniel chapter 17, uh, excuse me, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. And uh, there's a button here for me to pull up the whole chapter, which is what I want to do. 
Um, let me do it this way. Yeah, there is chapter 7. So in verse 13, way down here, Daniel has a vision. And in that vision, he saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. The Son of Man approached the Ancient One and was led into His presence. And then that Son of Man was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world. Who's he talking about there, John? Uh, you know what? You caught me reading ahead, Pastor. <laughs> so when... Uh, <laughs> so Daniel talks about the Son of Man here, and he says that he has given him authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world. Who's he talking about? Jesus. 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 Um, and, and that's what we have. Jesus uses this title, Son of Man, which frequently in the Old Testament is a title for the Messiah, and he applies it to himself. So it's just that much worse for the teachers of the law, when Jesus says, so the Son of Man might, um, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. He's saying, I'm the Messiah. I've got this authority. Good observation, John. Is, is um, Jesus the only one who called him the son of man he called himself the son of man did others call him the son of god um others called him the son of god uh there i believe are two references to jesus calling jesus the son of man and they both occur in paul if i'm not mistaken but by and large the title Son of Man in the New Testament is Jesus talking about himself. Yeah, okay. Any, any questions on uh, digging a hole in the roof of the house? I think that was pretty common. A lot of those houses, you went in through the roof. Uh, that's possibilities. First century house in Palestine. I'm just going to Google and pulling up images of a first century house in Palestine. You can pick any one and um, there we go. So you see kind of what they look like. And all of this area up here is just dirt. The roof was kind of like their patio. So they would uh, put down timbers and then branches and then sod on top of that and just let the grass grow. They did that to protect themselves from the heat of the day they didn't worry too much about rain because it hardly ever rained. And when it did, it was light. So uh, they preferred having uh, uh, sort of safety from the heat over having a dry house. Mm -hmm. Kind of like living in New York City today. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Any other observations that you guys want to make about the passage? I think it's interesting. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Andrea. <laughs> Thanks, Mimi. I think it's interesting that Jesus says, which is easier to say to the, to the man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. That's a great observation. So answer your question, Andrea. Which one is easier to say? 
well, if I am the, the person that is, is going to Jesus to be healed, I would say it's easier to, I want to hear, rise, take up your bed and walk. I think what Jesus is saying there is, um, so if I say I forgive your sins, there's a chance that those are just words. Yes. It's you like Hebrews 11, that. 1. Yeah. Yeah. It's unseen. Faith is unseen. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Where you but can if see I say, the healing. Stand up and walk. You can see if the guy gets up and walks or not. Mm hmm but when you think about it, which is easier? Is it easier to heal or is it easier to forgive sins? Only God forgives sins. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And they couldn't answer it because it's a tough question to answer. Mm -hmm. In one sense, it is easier to say, get up and walk. Mm -hmm. But in another sense... Uh, it's easier to say, oh, yeah, 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 I forgive you. <laughs> mm. Mimi, you were going to say something. I see that this is like, is this one, the first time that he's showing himself as fully God and fully man at the same time? Well, he's had other miracles before. So uh, it's probably not the first time, but this is, at least in Mark, the first time that him doing a miracle uh, causes uh, a major problem with the religious leaders of the day. Now it's obvious he's more than just uh, a prophet who's going to stick by the religious leaders. No, he's, he's serious. He's, he's uh, uh, pointing out some some issues that they got to deal with. He likes to give people food for thought. <laughs> he sure does. He sure <laughs> does. Just like he does with us. <laughs> well, listen, everybody, thank you so much for logging on. Um, I just wanted to show an example of a passage like this where um, just answering those six questions, who, what, when, where, how, and why. Uh, that gets us so much information there. So use those questions, especially when you come to narrative material like this. Most of the Gospels are narrative. The book of Acts is narrative. The vast majority of the Old Testament is narrative. Next week, though, we're going to look at a passage that is teaching, and uh, we will see some more of the relationships. I am going to try to get another study um, recorded somewhere that uh, I can kind of show you between now and next Wednesday, so that when we do this next Wednesday, it won't be the first time that we try it. It'll, it'll be the second time. Okay? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to who would like to pray for us before we leave here? Some brave soul. <laughs> I can pray. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Abba Father, thank you so much for your wisdom. Thank you for the word that we have um, to learn more about you. Uh, to hear from you, to understand you. Give us, um, thank you for the Holy Spirit that helps us understand and um, know more of you and um, and be closer to you. Thank you for Randy. Thank you for everybody that was part of the study tonight. Please uh, keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you amen. so much, Andrea. Yeah. Hey, it's great to see everybody. I am sure looking forward to when all of this is over and we can be together again. Thank Amen you. to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Keep Randy. studying. Keep studying. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.